Welcome back to RPTV Weekly News. I'm Kedar and joining me today are Jabin, Gabriel and Fred. Together we bring you updates on stories that directly impact Region Park and its neighboring areas. In this episode, we delve into the latest news from March 15 to March 22nd. Stay tuned for the latest updates and insights affecting our community. Region Park mourns tragic loss of father and son. Region Park Eid Bazaar and Market returns. Region Park community health workers rally for fair wages as strike deadline looms. Pam McConnell Aquatic Center closed for repairs. St. Bartholomew's Children's Center seeks new home amidst landlord restructuring. Metrolink hosts Moss Park Station information session on piling construction. Toronto Council debates FIFA costs, housing and parking fines. Toronto Police Chief addresses surge in hate crimes and auto thefts. Toronto Public Health issues warning amid surge in fatal opioid overdoses. Events and jobs in Region Park community. Region Park mourns tragic loss of father and son. Pain and grief have gripped Region Park and the local Congolese community since Nayogi Congalo 59 and Dieter Congalo 25, also known as John and Denzel respectively, were killed in a daylight shooting Tuesday, March the 12th, 2024. On Wednesday, March the 13th, police announced they charged 23-year-old Benedict Johnson Congolo, John's son and Denzel's brother, with two counts of first-degree murder. Detective Sergeant Tiffany Castell of Toronto's Police Homicide Unit said the March 12th shooting started inside a home and spilled over onto the street before Benedict was arrested following a brief pursuit. This was the first shooting in Region Park neighborhood in almost two years. As the community grapples with the weight of this loss, they gathered in solidarity to mourn and remember John and Denzel. A vigil held on Saturday, March 16, near the site of the shooting, saw over a hundred mourners, including local councillor Chris Moyes, paying their respects. The solemn gathering, marked by candles and floral tributes, honored the memory of the beloved father and son. My dad, he was a very, very strong man. A man that was always there for anyone that needed help. My dad was a man that, if he only had a dollar, you had a dollar. My dad, like, he had the biggest heart. Very warming, always there for anyone that needed help. He loved his kids with all his heart and would give anything for them. I know that the situation is very unfortunate, but through it all, I know that my dad still has a big heart for all of his kids, even the one that unfortunately caused this situation. My dad always, always had a big heart. Folks in the neighborhood, and they described your dad as king. He really was. He would give to anybody that needed help. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's an important trait. Important. My dad actually went by the nickname John de John, which means John of the Johns. He was very, very loved by the community. He was a man that always touched everyone. Like, like you said, he was known as a king. Always brightening everyone's spirits. As soon as he comes, everyone's always happy. He was really the life of the party. A very bubbly guy. Always knew how to make everyone laugh. And just always knew how to be there for everyone. The whole entire community loved him. And this is just a very big loss. It's a great event. It's a big great. Can I ask? I get involved with my mom was actually my dad's anchor. So she was always the woman of the house. My dad actually abided my mom's rules. So if my mom didn't want something to happen and she told my dad, my dad was there to make sure that like nothing happens. If we were ha ever having any issues, my mom would go to my dad and let my dad know and my dad would make sure that we were all straightened. We were raised in a very tight-knit family and my mom was always the strength of the family. Last question, so obviously today, we look of sympathy, support from the community, and beyond. 
It's honestly super, super heartwarming to see the outpour of support is beyond beyond anything I could think of. I'm very, very grateful, thankful. This community has always been a community that was very supportive, that always comes together. And so it's not surprising as I grew up here, I knew the tight knit community that we had. So this just goes to show how everyone loves each other over here and everyone's always there for each other. My last question is, point beyond the community, this will end up being seen by neighborhoods throughout our city. How can those folks reach out and the community help, support, how can they help the community? There is a GoFundMe that was set up by my dear friend Rebecca and if anyone wants to support you can go ahead and just donate to the family. It's going around on Instagram and I'm sure on Facebook and everything so that would be a way that would be a way to donate and support the family if anyone wanted to. Regent Park Eid Bazaar and Market Returns. Ramadan holds deep significance for Muslims worldwide serving as a time of fasting, reflection, and spiritual growth. As the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, Ramadan underscores the importance of compassion, self-improvement, and devotion to faith. The Eid Bazaar and Market embodies these values, fostering unity and celebration within the Regent Park community. Organized by the Center of Learning and Development, Mothers of Peace, Daniels, Toronto Community Housing, Artscape and the City of Toronto, the Bazaar showcases local vendors offering an array of goods including henna, jewelry, clothing and more. Residents and visitors are invited to explore the diverse offerings and support local entrepreneurs from traditional women's clothing to delectable snacks and artesian crafts. There's something for everyone at the Eid Bazaar. Join the vibrant Eid Bazaar and market on Wednesday, March 27th and April 3rd from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Daniel Spectrum, 585 Dundas Street East. RPTV reporter Keeter Ahmed was there to capture the excitement and chat with members of the Regent Park Muslim community. My name is Soraya. Uh, so, as you see, we are here in Daniel Spectrum. Uh, this is the first, the market for the Eid. Uh, we're going to have iftar this evening as well um, and very much needed right now to have this space and to be with the community. We have a clothing, foods, uh, skin products, henna, jewelry, check around them and come please and support the community members. We are here every Wednesday uh, for Wednesdays and then we will continue after Eid as well. Hey everyone, welcome and uh, happy Ramadan to everyone. I just learned a little bit more about the history. One of the ladies who's gonna give me some henna, she's gonna do both hands, just gave me a little rundown on the history of, Ra of Ramadan and fasting and getting closer to God. Um, today we have other uh, venues set up alongside I was set up over there and I was selling some jerk chicken tacos, some halal. I know they can't eat right now, but after seven, you know, they can feast and enjoy. Um, but I'm so proud and uh, excited to be a part of this, this feature. And uh, yeah, so happy Ramadan to everyone. My name is Radia. I live in Regent Park. Um, I do my own henna business um, on Instagram. It's called Mehendi.lego. Today we're here doing this Eid Bazaar. It's really amazing. We have some clothes that are being sold. We have free, sorry, not free henna. I am charging. It's a business. Um, we have some food over there, some like baked goods, like cinnamon buns and all that good stuff. We have some Ramadan exclusive designer type of brands for your, you know, like let's say you want a mug that says Ramadan Kareem, you can go get that. Um, and yeah, feel free to come by. This is happening every Wednesday from two to seven. Iftar will be given. Um, and yeah, hope to see you there. Hi everyone, my name is Ines Garcia. I started uh, Garcia Eats. I started with the popcorn and cotton candy and then a snow cone machine, hot dog machine. And now I have empanadas. I have beef, veggie, chicken, shrimp, and just cheese. Um, if you want to place your orders, follow me on Garcia Eats and 24-hour notice, and you get your empanadas, delicious. It's made all with love.
Regent Park community health workers rally for fair wages as strike deadline looms. On Friday, March 22nd, Regent Park Community Health Center workers rallied Tuesday, March 19th with a crowd of community members and allies to demand a fair deal for workers and the patients they support. These community health workers, members of OPSEU slash SEFPO, Local 5115, provide critical services and programs for people in the region park and surrounding communities, including life-saving overdose prevention programs, low barrier support for addictions and homelessness, primary health care, and much more under one roof. Workers on the foundations of this vital community, we're dedicated to Regent Park. We have Talks broke down after four months of bargaining when the employer refused to negotiate a deal that would put patients and workers first. But after 30 years of frozen benefits, the workers are standing firm in their demands for improved wages and benefits, and an internal work environment that is healthy and psychologically safe. And we're here all together to send a clear message to the Regent Park Community Health Center management that they are on notice. <laughs> Community health care workers deserve respect, and they don't deserve it just in words. They deserve it in better benefits, in better wages, because you are the heart of this community. <laughs> Some of you know this, I lived for 25 years up in the Diane Franklin Cooperative Homes over on Bleecker Street. I know what RPCHC means for this community. I know the work that you do, and I know that you are directly under attack because you are the fabric that holds it together. This neighborhood, this community is one of the most beautiful and vibrant communities in the city of Toronto. The folks who live here, who have been systematically pushed out and held down for decades, deserve the supports that you provide. But as workers, you deserve the supports you need to even live here and be able to support the folks who live here with you. It is shameful that this work is going unrecognized. It is more shameful that the management here is giving themselves raises, is giving themselves bonuses. I know the work that you do. It's important and crucial for Regent Park. You service a vulnerable community, a community that needs the work and the support that you provide, a community that looks like me, and I'm so proud and honored to be joining you here at this rally today. I want to tell you that it's not fair by the management to put you in a precarious situation. I get it. It's only, what, your second, your third collective agreement you've had negotiated here? I get it. They might not like unions. But we're going to show them the strength and the power of not just Atsu Sefbo, but of your local and of the broader labor movement here in the province of Ontario, the power of the Ontario Federation of Labor and the 54 unions. Everyone deserves to have a good job. There's no reason why you should be put in a situation where you are serving a vulnerable community when you yourself might be in a very precarious situation. How does that even make sense? It doesn't make sense. It's shameful. You deserve what you're owed. You deserve better wages. You deserve safety. You deserve dignity and respect. And if they won't give it to you, because trust me, they're not going to give it to you, we're going to take it. Now, I know this looming strike is on everyone's mind. And I hope that the management comes to their, sense, their census and comes to the table to bargain fairly and freely. But chances are, you might just be on strike. And the Ontario Federation of Labour is going to be there for these escalating actions. If you have to go on strike, we're going to be there. And when you win your collective agreement, a fair contract will be there as well. We are all standing behind you. We need you to know that always. 
we're with you. And we're asking for your members from 5115 to stand behind your bargaining team. They need you. They need you to stand in support. They need to know you've got their back. The rest of us have all your backs. You've got to have the backs of your bargaining team to show them when they go to that table that you're going to do what you need to do to make sure they get what they're asking for. They've only asked for 4%. They, you deserve way more. Yeah. You deserve way more. The, the least the employer could do is give you benefits that you can count on. Yeah. Yeah. A living wage that you can count on. Yeah. We don't want you to go to the food banks. We, don't, we want you to be able to feed your families. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And you, we've got you, we need you to know that you've got power. Yes, yes. Woo. There's no such power like the power of the worker, and the power of the worker won't stop. Say what? Pang McConnell Aquatic Center closed for repairs. The Pang McConnell Aquatic Center, 640 Dundas Street East, is closed for scheduled repairs until April 2nd. City staff are working diligently to resolve this issue. In the meantime, the pool at Wesley Community Center, 495 Sherburn, remains open. St. Bartholomew's Children's Center seeks new home amidst landlord restructuring. St. Bartholomew's Children's Center, SBCC, in Regent Park faces an uncertain future as their long-standing home, nestled within the St. Bartholomew's Anglican Church, undergoes structural renovations. After 40 years of dedicated service, SBCC received notice of vacate the premises by June the 30th to facilitate the church's overhaul, potentially spanning 30 months. As a vital service in the community, SBCC's caring staff have nurtured generations of children, offering before and after school care and specialized programs for over 1,000 students. Their quest for a new space has intensified, with requirements including an 835 square feet of unobstructed floor space and designated areas for essential functions like toileting, food preparation, and outdoor activities. The center appeals to the community for support and leads in securing a suitable location to continue their vital mission of fostering the growth and development of Regent Park's youth. Residents with potential space or leads are encouraged to reach out, ensuring SBCC can maintain its legacy of care and service for years to come. Metrolinx hosts Moss Park Station Information Session on Piling Construction. Metrolinx held a virtual community update session on March 20th, addressing the upcoming pylon construction at Moss Park Station as part of the Ontario Line project. The session covered project overview, progress updates, and mitigating impacts. Pylon, involving drilling to install structural walls, will begin as early as March 25th, with expected completion by July 2024. Work hours are set from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays, with occasional extensions for consecutive tasks. Residents can anticipate noise from drilling machines and concrete work, along with presence of various equipment on site. To minimize disruptions, Metrolinx assures monitoring limited work hours and adherence to designated routes for construction vehicles. Despite potential rescheduling due to unforeseen circumstances, efforts are in place to minimize disruptions to the community. So what is piling? Uh, it's simply just a foundational technique that we use um, to construct a support system, a foundational system in the ground. Um, and it provides us stability and support to protect the adjacent facilities and structures, uh, which is going to allow us to dig a hole in the ground, to put it very simply, and construct the station from the ground up. Um, it involves drilling multiple holes that overlap with each other, and this uh, these holes uh, integrate with each other to to form a wall, um, which provides a, a, a watertight barrier, uh, allowing us to excavate safely. The analogy that I like to use in general is uh, a swimming pool. So if you visualize a swimming pool, 
Um, the secant pile uh, is simply the, the, the pool perimeter, the walls. Um, but instead of filling the hole that we dig with water, we will build a station instead. And here's a, a very elegant uh, 3D model of what Moss Park or what to anticipate in Moss Park, what the site is going to look like um, specifically for, for the drilling commencement. What's highlighted here in the circles, in the pink circles, are the drill rigs. And so we are going to be using two, dr two rigs to start simultaneously. Um, that is to keep our installation rate um, as per what we are expecting for the schedule. They will work uh, in conjunction with each other, but obviously not on top of each other. They will be uh, separated by a small distance. Um, the location that they are in in this picture are roughly the starting positions that we will begin in Moss Park. So one on the west side of the shaft towards the armory, and then one somewhere intermediately on the south side facing towards Queen Street. Um, in this 3D model, we do have representation of what the tower cranes will look like in Moss Park. But to be very clear, the tower cranes are not going to be installed during the piling operation. This is just to provide a, a futuristic look as to some of the other features people can expect to see in Moss Park. Next slide, please, Amanda. Thank you. Um, so let's talk schedule uh, and sequencing, okay? Um, as I detailed at the start, the piling works uh, are ready to begin now. And uh, that begins with the guide wall installation that I gave a little context in an earlier slide. So we will look to begin uh, installing the formwork around the perimeter of the of the shaft. And then again, that's to properly locate where each of these piles are going to go. That's going to be starting immediately within the next couple of days um, for for work hours. So we are always going to do our best to respect uh, daytime working hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, obviously, that would be an effort to not uh, have a, a major impact on, you know, people's evenings or, or sleeping hours uh, in the local community. Um, for an estimated timeline, um, with this operation beginning here in the next couple of days, uh, the approximate time frame for this is four months duration. And so people can expect to see this relative consistency on a day-to-day -day time frame from, from now until the end of, uh, uh, of July specifically, okay? Toronto Council debates FIFA costs, housing, and parking fines. Toronto City Council embarked on a three-day City Council meeting held on March 20th, 21st, and 22nd with a packed agenda delving into pressing issues like the escalating costs of hosting the FIFA World Cup, addressing the housing crisis through a parking lot conversations, and proposing hefty increases in parking fines. Amid concerns over the soaring expenses associated with housing six FIFA World Cup matches in 2026, councillors scrutinized a staff update revealing a staggering increase in taxpayer costs to $380 million. Mayor Olivia Chow emphasizes the need for rigorous oversight and financial accountability amidst calls from community groups to ensure residents reap benefits from the event. Tomorrow's key item does just that, is our plan to transform city-owned surface parking lots into affordable housing. Many sites across the city that can be transformed into good affordable places to live, close to transit and close to the great amenities, uh, sites that represent hope for thousands of Torontonians. Now, growing up, I live only three minutes away from the Sherbourne subway, and it has been really, really convenient. Um, this is not the first time I've debated transforming city parking lots into housing. And this was a hot topic when I was a city councillor over two decades ago. And as you can see, the King's area has now lots of parking lots transformed into housing. It was imp I was impatient then, and even more so now. Tomorrow's item is uh, just a start. We have the, to match the severity of Toronto's housing crisis with the urgency and creativity of our actions. We have to leave no stone unturned when it comes to building desperately needed affordable housing to give people hope. I am now going to uh, talk about something that you are very interested in. Spring is also a time to tidy up. I think we can all relate that a good spring cleaning, getting in the corners, dusting things off, cleaning out the cobwebs of the past can help set you up for future successes. It's no different here. 
in the city. We have a little spring cleaning of our own to do. In just two short years, we will host the World's Game. Hosting six matches during the 2026 World Cup is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to deepen our connection to one another, stand united in our diversity, and make Toronto's global beacon of hope shine that much brighter. Now, while I didn't sign this deal, it's my responsibility as a mayor to do what I can to make these games a success, not only in the lasting connections it builds across communities, but also ensuring its financial sustainability. It's in that spirit that I am strengthening and clarifying the structure and mandate of some of the decision-making and advisory bodies that will play a key role in delivering FWC Fever World Cup 26. Today, Council will consider a plan to get the Toronto World Cup back on track. Soccer, or football, I've always want to call it, is a team sport, and so I've assembled an amazing team to help us deliver these games. We want to make sure that the spending plans and expenditures related to the World Cup will be tightly controlled. They must meet the standards of the residents of Toronto, stay within the prescribed budget for the event, and Budget Chief Councillor Sherry Carroll will chair that uh, World Cup subcommittee of the city's executive committee and make recommendations on the game's budget to the executive committee and of course it will go through council. Toronto Police Chief addresses surge in hate crimes and auto thefts. On Monday, March the 18th, Chief Myron Demkwe provided updates to the Toronto Police Service Board on hate crimes and auto thefts in the city. Since October the 7th, 2023, hate crimes have surged by 93% with 989 calls for service attended. A concerning trend shows 56% of reported hate crimes in 2024 are anti-Semitic, marking the highest in three years. Additionally, hate crimes against the 2SLGBTQI plus community have risen as well. Auto thefts and carjackings are also escalating with 68 carjackings recorded in 2024, a 106 increase from last year. It has been 163 days since the Middle East crisis began and the impact on our city is significant. Officers have made 24 protest related arrests and laid 30 charges since October 7th in response to threats, assaults and mischief. Investigations continue and charges may still be laid as investigators review evidence after some of these events. Policing public demonstrations in a free and democratic society is complex. We are seeing a change in behavior and tactics at demonstrations. We will not allow critical infrastructure to be closed by demonstrators. We will enforce the law and maintain the delicate balance between public safety and freedom of expression, and the right to assembly. Project Resolute continues to be a large-scale operation that involves engagement with the Jewish and Muslim communities, additional patrols, command posts, and increased presence around places of worship. This morning, I reported to the board that since October 7th, hate crime is up 93% over the same period last year. Since October 7th, we have attended 989 hate crime calls for service, and there have been 203 hate crime occurrences. We are attending, on average, 157 hate crime calls a month. Of the 84 hate crimes so far in 2024, 56% are anti-Semitic. While underreporting of all forms of hate is a concern, I know from talking to people in the community that Islamophobia is a significant concern and given our statistics, I am concerned about significant underreporting. Since October 7, 2023, there have been 69 arrests and 173 charges related to hate crime occurrences, including mischief, assault, and uttering threats. 
We continue to see hate-related graffiti with 342 occurrences since October 7th. I also spoke to the board about auto thefts and carjackings. Last year, more than 12,000 vehicles were stolen in Toronto. That's 34 vehicles every day. That's one every 40 minutes. We have seen a rise in carjackings and break and enters for car keys. We know this is a concern for our communities and we are continuing to take action. We are co-leading the Provincial Carjacking Task Force with the Ontario Provincial Police. They are doing exceptional work. As of yesterday, the task force has arrested 121 suspects, laid 730 charges, and recovered 157 stolen vehicles. We are putting a significant amount of resources forward to address this citywide. Toronto Public Health issues warning amid surge in fatal opioid overdoses. Toronto Public Health issued a stark warning after six fatal suspected opioid overdoses struck the city between March 14th and 17th, marking a troubling surge in deaths. The increase tripled the average over similar four-day spans in recent months, has raised concerns among health officials. The overdoses occurred across various parts of Toronto, prompting the TPH to highlight the dangers of the unregulated drug supply. Through Toronto's drug checking service, authorities identified two potent synthetic opioids, known as nidazine opioids, in street drug samples. These substances, up to 20 times more powerful than fentanyl, pose a significant risk to users. TPH emphasized the importance of harm reduction strategies, advising individuals to avoid using drugs alone, carry naloxone, utilize supervised consumption sites, and have their drugs checked for safety. With the potency of these opioids increasing the risk of overdose, TPH stressed the need for heightened vigilance and intervention measures to prevent further fatalities. Events and job opportunities in Region Park community. The Regent Park Safety Network invites you to a virtual meeting on Monday, March 25th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. For more information, please email leonard.swartz at rogers.com. Ramadan Iftar 2024 at Daniel Spectrum on Wednesdays 27th and April 3rd. Free meals from Regent Park caterers. For more information, contact Sharia at Sharia at tccld.org. All Saints invites the community to join the Good Friday Walk on Friday, March 29, 2024 at 9 a.m., 315 Dunnat Street East. This walk memorializes those who have suffered and died in the opiate epidemic. St. Jamestown Afrocentric Book Club, Saturday, April 6 at 1 p.m. at 200 Wellesley Street Community Corner. RSVP v. Edward at stjamestown.org. Toronto Community Housing, Our Spaces, Your Ideas. Tenants can book at TCHC Common Space for community events or programs. Types of bookings include private events, one-time bookings, reoccurring events. For more information, contact Felicia White at 416-356-7603. Need money for post-secondary school? Apply for the Investing in Our Diversity Scholarship. Eligible applicants can receive up to $400 to cover tuition fees and school-related expenses for full-time post-secondary education or training. Deadline to apply March 29, 2024. For more information, visit torontohousing.ca. Dixon Hall and Daniel Spectrum presents the Multilingual Community Resource Hub every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Daniel Spectrum Building. There will be assistance with resumes and cover letters, application assistant, oral translations, information and referrals for Canadian health care system, housing and government aids. Mental Health Matters presents Free the Sisterhood Self-Defense. Learn about self-defense, mental health, financial literacy and sexual education starting March 1st, 2024, every Friday until June 14th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at 259 Jarvis Street. Applications are now open for Dixon Hall Youth Incubator Program. 
hospitality and culinary training. Start date April 22nd, 2024. This is an eight-week program for OW clients who are interested in in-kitchen and online training with our Dixon Hall chef instructor. Online training with George Brown College Center for Hospitality and Culinary Arts. Career planning and job opportunities. Earning certifications. To register, speak to your OW caseworker to get a referral to the program. And that was all for events and job opportunities. Hope to see you there. And that's all for today's show. My name is Fred and my co-hosts are Javin, Gabriel, and Kitar. We also like to thank our team of researchers that contributed for this week's show. And from our studios located at Focus Media Arts Center, thanks for watching and see you next week. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please follow our social media platforms. For more information, check out our website. Thank you.